I am really happy and and so thankful to have Assembly Member Tasha Berner Horvath here with us today representing the 76th Assembly District, which is in San Diego County. Assembly Member Berner Horvath was first elected in 2018, the year that I like to refer as the year of the woman which was two years after that horrible man was elected president and everybody got compelled to run for office. And we saw a slew of excellent leaders come into the Capitol and among them was the assembly member. She is also the chair of the Select Committee on Sea Level Rise and the California Economy and the Assistant Majority Leader for Policy and Research, which means she is a member of the leadership team in the assembly under the speaker, Anthony Redden. So thank you so much for joining us, Assembly Member. How are you? I'm good. It's, so, it's such a great day to be here with all you people who want to learn how to advocate in state legislature. A little bit about me. So it's so interesting. Six years ago, I was a PTA mom trying to get a stop sign near my kid's school. I had never thought about being in politics. I had studied political science, but I was like interested in social movements and value shifts and international political economy. So I was interested in nerdy things, which is I think why the speaker made me the majority leader of policy research. And I just say I'm the queen of the nerds. So, and we need more nerds in an elected office, I think. And so yeah. I was then recruited to run for council in my city, Encinitas. My district is Encinitas, Carlsbad, Oceanside, Vista, and Camp Pendleton. I am the first Democrat since 1978 to hold this office. And so it was a very big win in, in 2018 for me to be elected to the state assembly. But I tried to get the stop sign. I was really good at stop signs because I got on the council and then I got a second stop sign. It was like, my work is done and it blinks. So that makes it really awesome. People still comment on that stop sign when they go through. But I did lots of other things. I think everything I do, I put in the buckets of sustainability, opportunity, and equality and equity. So... If I were to give some advice on advocating effectively, whether it's local city councils, if it's your school board, if it's like for a stop sign and a traffic commission, one of the best things you could do is be sure you're communicating in a way that people can hear. When you talk at people, they, they hear your words, but they may not get your meaning. And when you have limited time with elected officials, it's always important to think to yourself, what is the outcome I want to achieve? Like, do I want her to vote a certain way, right? If you just want my vote, you're going to sit and tell me what you want. I'll say thank you and I'll, I'll move on, right? If you want to engage me, then you'll ask questions like, you know, how does sea level rise affect your district, right? And then that's engaging. So I think it's really important for folks to come in and think about what is the outcome. And I think that's what actually, even though I never wanted to be in politics, I never thought about being in politics. I did marketing and communications for 15 years. I think what makes me effective in, in both that city council role that I have from 2016 to 2018, as well as the state assembly, is the ability to communicate. I come from, you know, it's a nonpartisan thing. A parent-teacher organization is by definition nonpartisan. You basically want the best stuff for your kids, right? Yep. And that's universal. And so finding those universal messages we all agree on that's right. and communicating in a way that people can hear. And, and being clear about the outcomes you want. And so those are kind of some of my tips on advocating. And I can say from my personal experience, there are people who take really aggressive stances. And there's some times where we do feel so passionately about an issue that we are aggressive. But just know that that aggression works both ways. Like if your outcome is to get my vote and you're protesting outside my kid's school or you're putting my family on social media, what yeah. do you think? that invasion of privacy will mean to me and how I will react, right. right? So I think there are more effective ways to advocate. And by knowing what your legislator or your local city council, what your local school board, where they stand, it makes it easier. So if you wanted to talk to me about sustainability, well, I talk about sustainability all the time, right? And so you could say, Tasha, or assembly member, they all, you always have to call people by the title. I just say Tasha because Bernard Horvath is really a complicated last name. And clearly I did not know I was going to get into politics when I took my husband's last name. He took my, my last name. So I'm Bernard Horvath. He's Bernard Horvath. The kids are all Bernard Horvath. None of us had any idea that, that we, that's what we were doing. <laughs> and so I think the effective thing is to say, say you have an issue 
around greenhouse gas emissions and a certain climate change bill, right? Or recycling, recycling is a good one. You really have feel passionate about recycling. You don't wanna see single use plastics on our beaches and our streams and our waste. You wanna make sure we're reducing greenhouse gases and so that we have a planet for our kids, right? Yep. What you would wanna know about me, and that's kind of your research is like, okay, she is an advocate for sustainability. She talks about sustainability. That's right. That's good. So you, I'm a friendly person. So you don't need to convince me of something I'm already convinced of. Right, right. What you may want to tell me is how my community supports that thing that I also agree on. Right. right? So I think that's a really good um, so way of um, advocating. Super segue. And by the way, your story about the stop sign is like literally the symbol uh, or, or the perfect example of all politics is local. <laughs> You can't get more local than a stop sign. Nope. And it's still there. So I got that stop sign in six years ago. And just to let you know, today we have hundreds of kids biking and walking to school because that stop sign made it safer for them to do so. That's, so yeah. like, I, I think it's also important when you advocate for something to go back and tell your the person who you know maybe voted your right way or supported you what you wanted to say, thank you. Look at the difference it's making today. Because right. sometimes we see that and sometimes we don't. So... Really, really appreciate good. all of you. Christina, you're so fabulous for doing this. I know they've been popular throughout the state. Really appreciate you coming in and talking about all politics are local and really how to get our youth you know, activated. I have a 10 and 13 year old and, and you know, my son has very, I think he learns most of his political uh, speaking skills from John Oliver, which may or may not be good. So, <laughs> you know, right. there's that. So. Well, let me, let me ask you a quick question then. So sure. How would young people, actually anybody, right, organize their communities locally to impact what is happening in Sacramento? We want the legislature to do a certain thing. We as individuals can make a phone call, right? I could see you and say, please do this. But that's me, right? How do I embark on organizing a, a community as a voice? and then activating that community to send a message effectively. And so I'm interested in your thoughts on like, what does community advocacy look like? And how do you think groups or organizations can best use their time? Like what should they be doing and what should they not be doing? Yeah, so when I would think about community advocacy, I would go back to my stop sign because I was just a community advocate, right? Like I was just a mom who was waiting 45 minutes to pick up my kids. Why are we emitting greenhouse gas emissions and idling for 45 minutes picking up kids? And we got that down to 12 minutes, by the way. That was what we got it down to. So people stopped wasting 45 minutes of my time. But what we did is, and I think it's a great framework to think about things in, is what can we do to make a difference? What do we need a company or an administration to do to make a difference, to reach that outcome you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. And then where, where does government play a role? So for example, with our stop sign, we knew we could space out the parents. We knew we could change our drop-off lanes, but we knew none of that could happen without that stop sign going in. So it was a very powerful thing saying, we could reduce the backup on a, on a major road from parents waiting to drop off their kids for 45 minutes yeah, I would think we, we reduced the, the, the time waiting on the major road to three minutes is actually because we ended up building a queuing lane as well. So we said, what can we do? Well, we could educate the parents. We could create drop-off lanes. What, what can the school do? Well, the school could give land to the city so we can create a queuing lane so that they're queuing off of the main street. And three, what do we need the city to do? Well, we need the city to put in that soft sign we needed them to move on different stop sign to get the one that blinks. That was really great. And then we needed them to build the queuing lane. So you think about, if you think about your advocacy, advocacy is rarely effective when it's one dimensional. Yeah. So we got our parents together. We got our teachers together. We got the kids together. We got the neighbors together. And to anticipate who's going to oppose, why are they going to oppose? Mm -hmm. If they're going to oppose, talk to them early and right. see if you can reach some sort of consensus. Most reasonable people can agree on most things. You know, and so that's how I construct it is what can we do by ourselves? What do we need this organization to do? And what does the role, what's the role in government in that, right? And sometimes government is the final decider or in our case, without that stop sign, we couldn't do our work. Without that stop sign, we couldn't change our queuing lane structure. So we created two separate lanes, right? 
So that's how I would kind of conceive of it. I don't know. That's kind of like a wonky mommy answer, and especially if we're talking yeah, about you, really all of you. Practical, yeah. practical answer. And here's a question I get asked all the time. Should people outside of your district be calling you? Do you care? Do you, does your staff note that? When they call? So when we record calls, we record calls from everybody, but there's a category of outside of the district. And when I vote on a bill, mm -hmm. I'll just tell you about me. I can't speak for my colleagues. When I vote on a bill, I look, I get a breakdown from Janet Chin. She's on my call, on this call. She's my district director. She'll give me a breakdown every week of who's called in on what bills. And that breakdown is only people from the district. And the other thing that's not very effective, I just ran to somebody and they were they were advocating for a very, very good environmental cause. Mm -hmm. And they said, this is a really good environmental cause and we're gonna have all of our members send this form letter to your office. And I said, we have a special category for form letters. So if you're, you know, some people like to use change.org and some of these other organizations right, right. to do form letters. Those letters get put in a separate category because yeah. it's somebody, because they can be misused. So while you might use it for the right point purpose, yeah. they can be easily misused. And people say to get more information from your legislator, click here. And it's actually a form letter that people aren't reading the details of. That is a position they may or may not have. So yeah. they, the form letters can be misused. So they go in a separate category. So if we get 50 of the same letter, it yeah. counts as one. Ah, very important <laughs> information right there. Phone calls, emails, social media, what, where has, what's the greatest priority in terms of outreach to you? So I would say that the phone calls are the most important. Those are the ones we log, but email is equally important. So, but I wouldn't call and I wouldn't call an email. You don't need to do that because most legislative offices that I know, and this is how my office works, we get either something through email or something through a phone call and we record it in our system. And you only get, it doesn't matter how many times you call my office, Christina, you get one record, right? <laughs> if you call on the bill, you can call I, one, okay. right? Mm -hmm. So so bombarding offices with the same five people calling is not an effective strategy because what it shows us are five people care very passionately about this, but you'll be recorded on our system once, right? As this person opposes the bill, which does go in. Like when we go in, we have an electronic tracking system. So when people file actually personal letters through the uh, committee portals on position bills, on bills, mm -hmm. that actually gets recorded. And I can go in, I can say which organizations oppose and I support which organizations oppose. And I see constituent positions. Mm. So if my constituents are using the assembly legislative portal to submit letters of support and opposition, I see that too. What I take that into consideration is somebody's taken the time out of their day yeah. to go in fill out a letter, upload it to the system. And then I was like, oh, you know, there are 20 people who care about this issue. So I think that's really important. So I think what you're hearing is there's a lot of well-intentioned groups that have grassroots ways of advocating, but those grassroots way of advocating have been often uh, misused by organizations. And so we have to have ways to differentiate what is one of yeah. my constituents yeah. positions that's unique and individual. So that's how we differentiate it. So call or email, both are good. They get, every call gets registered from my district. We do register calls from outside the district, but that's a separate list. Form emails are not very effective as you think they are. You know, that's just, mm -hmm. just not how it is. Even if they change slightly, yeah. you know, we, we, and they're an individual letter, but the ones that are generated where we get hundreds of them, we know that somebody just clicking, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. And often those are outside of the district too. And then, you know, there is the, the position portal on every bill that is being heard and committed. If someone wants to, to get to know you, right? They're a constituent, they're a community org person, a, a, you know, an aspiring leader, right? Like they're a young person who's like, I really want to you know, do this one thing. This is my passion. I, I want to do more. How do they start building a genuine relationship with you? Where, what should they be doing? So if you have an issue that you're passionate about, so one of the things that people, I think in Sacramento folks are used to, but people in the district are not used to it is 
I have staff. I'm in Sacramento Monday through Thursday. I'm physically not at my dis district office Monday through Thursday from January to, you know, end of August, you know, beginning of September. So my staff, whether it's my district director or field reps, they are my representatives. You can easily meet with them, develop a relationship with them, talk to about the issues. They're my staff. They will tell, I, tell me. I get, as I said, my weekly report, like, that we met with these people there, this is their issues. They feel very passionately about this. So one, I don't think it has to be with me personally. We have offices for a reason. I represent 500,000 people. And while I would love to have a personal individual relationship with every 500,000 of my constituents, that's really hard, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so I would say that's the reason we have staff. And so create that relationship with the staff. Yeah. And, you know, and I think, Depending on the issue, if that issue is a nexus to either a committee I'm on or a bill I'm voting on or something important to, for me, it's sustainability, opportunity, quality, and equity, you could always ask for a meeting with me. And I think the more, the, the more successful advocacy that I've seen are, is people who already have done research. So like, you don't really need to explain climate change to me. Like, I actually understand climate change. It's right, fine. Right. So you don't need to st start the relationship assuming I don't know it, but yeah. to ask questions and be inquisitive. Like, you know, I know you're really interested in climate change and the climate crisis. Yep. I'm really passionate about this. We would like to talk about this issue. And it's perfectly fine to say, how familiar are, familiar are, are you with, you know, sea level rise and coastal erosion? Well, I'm the select committee chair of sea level rise in California. I'm very familiar with it. You don't have to give me the background on coastal erosion. You can start with the issue that we're having. That's and right. I like to set up things with, of like, here's the issue. These are some options. This is our preferred solution. And if it's a bill, if it's something like that. So I think there's that, that I also have district advisory councils where I love for people to serve on, uh, if you're an expert in a field and you know, that, that would be great. And community leaders, you know, or organizations, nonprofits are on that. So if you're a specific skill set that could be added to, to one of our district advisor councils. I also require everybody on the district advisory council to do lots of work. So just not to know, it's not just a relationship building thing. There's work involved. <laughs> so, uh, so, that, so those are some of the ways. And then the other thing is if you have an organization that has a meeting in my district, I'm usually happy to come out and meet with organizations. Excellent. Okay. So that's a, that's a great thing of, you know, we know you're a leader on climate change. We have this issue. We'd love to come and have you report on what the legislature is doing. Perfect. On this that issue. is such a great idea. Such a great mm -hmm. idea. And I bet you people didn't even realize they could ask you to do that. I think, well, when I took over my district in 2018, they didn't know that we came out and, you know, I'm happy. I'll read a book to any elementary school class at anywhere in my district. I, I will go to any library. I will do all the things. I love that stuff. So awesome. I love, because I come from community advocacy and I'm a community leader myself. And so I love that. I say when people are doing innovative, great ideas and they're bringing people together, I want to be, us to work together. So I come from that collaborative approach. So I love it. I love yeah. everything that you're saying. I want to be super respectful of your time. Any last words before you have to jump off? I just want to thank you, I, Christina. This is so great that you're going through all this with all these folks. I would say, don't be a stranger. You know, I think there's, there, there's no way to succeed if you don't try. And I think we're facing so many things, whether it's challenges of income inequality or the climate crisis, there's so much facing us that we, I'm not going to solve those problems alone. I can never solve it as your assembly member alone. Yeah. I think it has to be our solution together. So what I would encourage any of you on this call is whether you're in my district or not, reach out, start building that relationship with your legislator, with their staff, invite us to events big or small, depending on our scale. And then the other thing I would say is be patient with us. We do represent 500,000 people. So sometimes it does take like four to six weeks to, you know, get me on a calendar somewhere. So if you're doing something and you're like, can you come Friday? I probably can't come Friday. Right. You know, so be respectful of there's that time. And, and I would say like, I'm also a mom. So I have my kids events. So if I can't come at that time, maybe I can come at this other time. So a little grace is always welcome, but advocate, you know, the, and the, you know, the one last thing I'll leave you with, because this is a webinar geared at, at younger folks. If you let people, I, I think I look younger, but I'm 48 years old. 
If you let people like me make the decisions, you're not going to get the world you want. So without your advocacy, you're going to let people who are much older than you be making all the decisions for the future world you're going to live in. Oh so yeah. the imperative of your advocacy is so important and it can yeah. never be discounted. Oh my and God. I think always go in with compassion, kindness, grace, and assume good intention. Most legislators are in public service because we want to serve. So that would be my parting words. Well, I want to thank you. My like, name is Tom. You hit my heart with that. Thank you so much. And I, I thank you, thank you, thank you for taking this um, serious opportunity to talk to, to folks. So thank you and have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.